Uh, well, good morning, everyone. We are continuing our series on the book of Daniel, Daniel's Visions. We finished the stories a while back, but now we've come back to it. Things to come, Daniel's Visions. In the first message, we looked at the vision of the four beasts, which parallels chapter 2, the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so here you find that the statue had a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet mixed with iron and clay, and rock cut without hands. And we said that the interpretation of that is the, the head, Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head, O king, is the Babylonian Empire. The chest and arms, the Medo-Persian Empire, the belly of brass and thighs, uh, and thighs of, uh, of brass with, was the Greek Empire, and the legs, the rest of the legs, the Roman Empire, and the revived Roman Empire followed by Christ's kingdom, which is the rock cut without hands. In chapter 7, Daniel has the same vision, but this time instead of a statue, he sees animals. That's why we have animals today in the, in the stage, you know, as for BBS. Uh, and he, he saw, instead of a head of gold, he saw a lion with wings, which is the Bab Babylonian Empire. And Babylon actually began deporting uh, the Israelites starting in 60, uh, 605 B.C. Then he saw the Medo-Persian Empire who took over the Babylonian kingdom. But instead of a chest and arms of silver... He saw a bear with one shoulder higher. Why is that? Because when these two empires began working together, at first it was the Medes that was prominent. Later on, it was the Persian that was more powerful. In fact, later on, it just became known as the Persian Empire. And then you, you see, instead of the belly and thighs made of uh, bronze, he saw a uh, leopard with four heads and four wings. Uh, speaking, uh, um, talking about the speed of Alexander's conquest of the world. In 10 years, he comp conquered all of the Persian Empire. Uh, unfortunately, he died when he was just 32 years old. And then the Roman Empire, which actually officially began in 146 B.C., and this is the empire that was in power when Jesus was born. And so 600 years before Jesus was born, Daniel had this, this vision of all the empires that will take place uh, before Jesus came to the world. In a vision of the four beasts, we said we will trust God who is sovereign over kingdoms for the things that trouble us. The God who is in charge or controls the kingdom of the world, uh, controls the kingdom of our lives, controls our lives, uh, controls our, our personal um, history. Uh, in the next chapter, this was last week, we saw the vision of the ram and the goat. And this focuses on the middle two kingdoms, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. But this time, instead of a bear, he saw a ram. But again, the, the, the feature is that one of the horns is bigger, meaning that at first um, the Medes were in power, but later on the Persian became more prominent. And then he saw a goat. Instead of a, um, a cougar or a jaguar, or what was that? Leopard. <laughs> I'm getting mixed up with all these animals. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a goat. But again, the, the characteristic of speed, that as he saw this goat, the feet didn't even touch the ground. And then it had a horn that was later on divided into four parts. As we know, after Alexander died, his four generals took over. And they were divided into four kingdoms. The most, the most prominent was the Seleucid Empire, where Antiochus Epiphanes came from. And he's the one that persecuted the Jews during the time of the Maccabean period. Uh, if you read First and Second Maccabees in the Apocrypha, this speaks of what happened. And he foreshadowed the one who's coming, the one who will be the Antichrist. We'll talk more about that. In our text. And so we said that we are comforted by the truth of God's word, proven by the accuracy of prophecy. Why do you believe God's word is true? Why do you believe in the Bible? Well, first, because Jesus believed in it. Jesus says, Sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. Why do we believe Jesus? Because he rose from the grave. 
But there's another reason why we believe the Bible is true, and it's because of fulfilled prophecies. This morning, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, and we will study the vision of the 77s. Before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we're so grateful to you for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. We thank you, Lord, that it's because of his shed blood that we're able to enter your holy throne. We're able to pray. We're able to commune with you. And I pray, Father, that you would encourage our hearts today as we look into this, um, in this, into this passage that you would not only help us understand, but help us, Father, to apply these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite professors in seminary was Dr. Howard Hendricks. I still remember one of the classes I took under him, which was Bible study methods. Uh, how to study the Bible. Of course, the first thing he teaches you is how to observe the Bible. The difference between a good Bible teacher and a great Bible teacher is the power of observation. And so the first assignment, he, he, he made us do 50 observation in Acts 1.8. That's a familiar passage, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He says, uh, for tonight's assignment, I want you to make 50 observations. And so we were all gung-ho about it. We came back to the, to the dorm, and we were making these observations. And the first, you know, 10, 20, 30, you're kind of making all these observations, and and by the time you get to 35, you start slowing down. 40, oh man, this is hard. Uh, after about an hour, maybe you get to uh, 45, and the last five, you're just, you're just kind of making stuff up. <laughs> okay, oh man, what else could I observe about this? It's written in English, oh, wait, actually, Hebrew, uh, Greek first. I mean, we're just trying to make things up. So finally, you get 50 to fulfill the assignment. And and you're excited, you, you go to the next class, you're ready to turn in the paper, and, and, and he says to us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, hang on to your paper, I want, I want you to make 50 more observations. Going, what did he say? <laughs> what? 50 more? I could hardly get 50. And then I'll never forget what he said that class. He said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that you have not exhausted the text you have merely exhausted yourselves. <laughs> and sure enough, you go home and you begin to meditate on the word and you begin to study it more and you get 50 more observations because the Bible is that deep. The Bible is that, that powerful and that rich. Uh, the Bible is relevant because it is revealed. It is from God. So you can never really exhaust it. See, the problem with us many times is we, we reach a passage like Daniel chapter 8, like last week. The ram and the goat. And we give up so soon. Oh, man, I can't understand it. Forget this. And, and even when we go to church, we hear a, a message like that and, and we begin to fall asleep. Why is that? Because many Christians, they simply want to be entertained. They don't really want to be fed the word of God. Not you guys, other, other churches. <laughs> other churches. But let me submit to you that every single passage in the Bible is relevant for us. Every single passage in the Bible addresses things in our lives if we would just allow it to minister to us. If we would just take some time to focus and concentrate on it. And it's especially important to focus and meditate on God's word when we're going through trials. When you're about to make a major decision. Or when you're discouraged about your marriage or discouraged about ministry or discouraged about life. Why? Because it is the word of God that will instruct you. It is the word of God that will guide you. It is the word of God that will encourage you. And so we need to have a resolve to, to study and go back to God's word whenever it is that we're going through trials. In the passage that we read, of course, the context is that the nation Israel was going through big time trial. Why is that? Because they had been taken into captivity and brought into this strange world, into this strange land, Babylon. And the reason for that is because they had disobeyed God. And so Daniel, as he looks back on 
the state and the, of, of Israel and where they were at, he, he goes back to the word of God and he, he reads according to chapter 9 verse 1. He reads from the book of Jeremiah. The response whenever you're going through trials is always to read God's word. It says in verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent Amid, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So the context is, remember King uh, Belshazzar, who, had, who saw the, on the wall of men and men at Tekel of Parson. And Daniel told him, you have been weighed and found wanting, and tonight your kingdom will be ripped away from you. And sure enough, that night, the Medes, the the, the Medo-Persian army, they diverted the Tigris River, which flowed through Babylon. And unknown, unbeknownst to Belshazzar and his, and his uh, officers who were in this party, who were drinking all night, they didn't know that surely but slowly the river was going down. And an army was able to go underneath the tunnel, and they were able to open the gates. And that night, Babylon was no more. That night, the Persian Empire took over. And so this was the first year of the Medo-Persian Empire, and that's when Daniel received this third vision that we will study. In verse 2, he says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of, the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. On one hand, Daniel was, of course, lamenting the fact that Israel was still, still under ca captivity. But on the other hand, he was excited. Why was he excited? Because according to Jeremiah, the years of captivity were 70 years. At this point, Daniel had been in captivity 66 years. He is now in his 80s. He has now served many kings in the Babylonian Empire. Now in the Persian Empire, he's, ser he's serving once again. And so he's excited because he knows that, that God's word is true and this was about to be fulfilled. And so he began to pray, he began to pray for the fulfillment of this prophecy. He began to pray for Jerusalem to be restored, for the temple to be rebuilt, and for God to once again vindicate his name. You know, whenever we pray, always base your prayers on God's truth. Always base your prayers on God's promises. Why is that? Because when we pray according to his will, guess what? He hears us. Here in this passage, you find Daniel praying, and there are three aspects to not only to his prayer, but also to the fulfillment of what he was praying for in this passage. Three things that we want to see this morning. First of all, we see the request of Daniel. We see him asking for God to restore Jerusalem. It says in verse 3, Then I turned my face to the Lord God. Seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Here you find a principle that even though God has promised it, even though God has prophesied it, it's still through our prayers that these promises uh, come about. That's why even though God promises to supply your need, what are you still to pray for? Give us this day our yeah, daily bread. So if God has already promised to supply, why are you praying? Because it is through your prayer that these promises come true. It is through your prayers that God is able to, uh, to fulfill his, his, his will for your lives. Those two things go hand in hand. And so even though God has promised that Daniel was still praying, God, restore your people. Verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God, and, and made confession, saying, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love to those who love him and keep his commandments. He began praising God. God, you are faithful. God, you, you are, you are a, a promise-keeping God. He says, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled. God, it is not because you're not loving Lord, it, it is not because you have been unfaithful. It's, Lord, because we have sinned. And by the way, God's faithfulness, whenever we talk about God's faithfulness, many times we think of simply of his blessings. When you're blessed, oh, God's faithful. 
You know, I, I got healed. Oh, God is faithful. I got a job. God is faithful. I passed my test. God is faithful. But God's faithfulness also relates to his discipline. When we talk about God's faithfulness, it means that God is true to his word. And what he said to the Israelites is, if you obey, I will bless you as a nation. But if you disobey, I will punish you. I will discipline you. And so what, what Daniel was saying is, God, you, you keep your promises. You keep your covenant. You have been faithful. And the reason we're in our predicament today is not because you have forgotten us. It's not because you have forgotten your word, but because we have sinned and done wrong. Don't you like that about Daniel? No, Daniel didn't say, Lord, they have sinned and done wrong. He included himself. He says, Lord, we have sinned. Now, when you pray for our nation, is that how you pray? Lord, the Republicans have sinned. Lord, the Democrats, they have sinned. No, when you pray for a nation, how should we pray? Lord, what? We have sinned. We have sinned. If God is going to bring revival to our land, it begins with us. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, if what? My people. Let's read this together. It's a great verse. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You want revival in our land? You want healing in our land? Then when we pray, it's not, Lord, forgive them. It's, Lord, forgive us. It says if they would turn not from non-Christians. They act like non-Christians because that's how they're supposed to act. But he says, if my people who are supposed to be godly, who are supposed to be those who exemplify the the character of Christ, if my people, he says, will turn from their wicked ways, he says, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. If this nation of ours is to find healing, it begins with us. It begins with us having the attitude of Daniel, Lord, we have done wickedly before your sight. In verse 6, he says, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who have spoken in your name to our kings, our princess, and our fathers, to all the people of the land. So Daniel says, Lord, it's because we have been disobedient to the word, because we have been disobedient to your laws. Now, what is this particular law? Now, it, it is the law that he's speaking of is the commandment to allow the land to to follow. In other words, to rest every seven years. And they didn't do it. And so God judged them. In verse 7, it says, To you, O Lord, belong righteousness. In other words, God, you're just in dealing with us this way. Uh, It is our bad. We we blew it. It But to us, open shame. As at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all Israel, those who are near, those who are far away, and all the land to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. Lord, it's because we have disobeyed your laws. Now, what, what, is, that? what is that law? Exodus 23, 11. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie follow, that the poor of your people may eat, and that you may leave the beasts and the field may eat, that you shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. So what, what is this law? When, people, when the Israelites first went into the land, God says, every seventh year, do not, do not till the land. Uh, in other words, let it rest. Why is that? Because if you continue to plant on land, and you know this from modern uh, agriculture, what happens? All the nutrients get leached out of the land, and it needs time to rest. It needs time to recover. And so God says, every seventh year, you are to do that. Now, it doesn't mean every single farm was to, to lay, lie follow. In other words, they, they are to stagger it. So some, but at least every seventh year, part of your land or all of your land, whichever part, is to rest. 
And the reason for that is, one, so that it'll rest. But secondly, so that poor people always have a place to pick, to glean. That was their Faith Food Fridays, those uh, places that are not being, not being tilled. And then also, it is, it's, it is for you to trust. So let's say I have three plots of land and, or seven plots of land, and I staggered it. So every year, I'm going to trust that God would provide for me through the other, through the other lands, and I'm not going to max out my, my potential for earning. So part of it is to learn to trust God, that, God, I'm going to allow this to rest, but I'm going to trust that you will provide for the other lands. Or maybe if, if you just have one, that you're going to give me a bumper crop on the sixth year. And so it was a lesson on trusting. It was a lesson on obedience. This was not just some innocuous agricultural tip. It's not just like, oh, put extra fertilizer in that. It's not, it's not that way. It was God teaching the Israelite to trust and obey. There is never such thing as a small act of obedience to God. Everything God tells us is given to us for our good. And so when, when you, you know you're disobe- disobeying God in one area, don't think, oh, it's just one small area. No. That could be the very area that God is waiting for you to, to submit so that he could bless you. And so find Daniel confessing to God. And then Daniel appeals to God's character. He says, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. God, you are merciful. Yes, you are righteous, but you are also merciful and loving. Verse 13. We'll skip some of the verses. He says, as it's written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come to us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. You see that? It says, God has already told you in his word why you're being disciplined. But God has already told you in his word how you could get back up. God has already told you how you could get back into fellowship with him and get back into his good graces. But he says, but we have not what? We have not entreated the favor of the Lord by turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. He says, as it is written in the law of Moses. Why were the people missing out? Because they were not reading the word of God. Why do we miss out in our Christian life? Why is it that we have so so much unnecessary anxiety, so much unnecessary um, problems and trials that's weighing heavily upon us? Because we haven't read the word of God. We haven't seen what God has to say about our particular situation. The response to trial is always to go back to God's word. And verse 16, O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger, your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. God, please, Lord, be merciful. Don't be angry with us anymore. It says, your holy hill, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. There's a word that occurs and Again and again in the prayer of Daniel, you know what that word is? It's the word your. Your city, your holy hill, your people. What was Daniel doing? He said, God, I'm asking this not because of us. I'm asking this, Lord, because it is your name that is at stake. So we have become a laughing stock. We have become a byword among all the people around us. People are saying, (laughs) <laughs> Those people, look at their gods. They claim to have the true God, and look where they are now. They're in captivity. And so Daniel was saying, God, it's not about us. It's about your name, because we are your people. We are, we are, it is your city. It is your nation. And so, God, it is your name at stake. Verse 17, now therefore, God, listen to the prayer in your servants and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord. Again, Lord, it is for your own sake. It is so that your name is glorified. It's so your name will be magnified. That's why I'm asking that you restore your nation, that you restore your people, that you restore the holy hill, that you restore the sanctuary. Why? For your sake. Because, oh, Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. 
Lord, we build the temple. We build your city. We build your nation for your sake. Verse 18, oh, oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation. Lord, have mercy on us. Have pity on us. We are desolate. In the city that is called by your name. It says, for we do not present our pleas because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. I love this. Daniel says, God, it's not because we've been good that I'm asking for your mercy. Lord, it's solely based on your character. And it's the same thing with us today. Whenever we ask for anything from the Lord, understand that every answered prayer was paid for at the cross. Sometimes we have the mistaken idea that it's because I've been good that God now answers my prayer. That's never the case. On your best day, you don't deserve God's blessing. On my best day as a Christian, I do not deserve God's blessing. It is because of Jesus Christ. So, so is obedience then inconsequential? So why do we obey? Because our obedience is the instrumental cause of God blessing us. It is never the meritorious cause. Let me say that again. When you obey God, the merit is because of Christ. It's not because you obey. But you obey so that it opens up the door for God's blessing. Now, The, the way I, I illustrate it, it's like when you open the, your, um, the spigot on your on your faucet, when you open it up, it allows the water to come through. But that water is in the reservoir. It's in the dam. That is why the water flows. It is not because you open the spigot. The opening up of spigot allows it to flow through. But the spigot is not the source of the blessing. And so when you obey, it's like opening up the spigot. But the dam, the resource, is the cross. Amen? Okay, so don't ever think that because I am obedient to God, that God somehow owes me. That's why Daniel says, it is, because, it is not because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy that you are now going to answer my prayer. And so he says in verse 19, oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not, do Delay not for your own sake, oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Again, again and again, Lord, it's for your sake. It's for your name. It's because of your, of, of your reputation that is at stake. And then God answered. I mean, how could you not answer a prayer like that? Oh, based on God's word, based on God's character, based on on, on, uh, God's, uh, on, on God's glory. I mean, that, that kind of prayer, God answers. And so he responds. And what does he do? He sends Gabriel. He says, well, I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel. So this time, uh, Gabriel appears as a man. Uh, whom I had seen in the vision at the first time, came to me in a swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. For Daniel, time, even though he was in Babylon, his mind was still in Israel. His mind was still in Jerusalem. And he still, in his mind, thought of the evening and morning sacrifice. And so whenever he prays, he would open up his window and he would face Jerusalem and he would still think, of the evening sacrifice. That's still what's prominent in his heart. Even after all these years, his mind was still on Jerusalem. It says in verse 22, He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. Daniel, let me explain to you not only when this will happen, but what will happen after it. And I guess that's what Daniel was asking for. He was not only asking for the restoration, he was saying, Lord, what's going to happen after? Lord, explain to me more about the ram and the goat. Remember last week, he said he still didn't understand. He's still praying for more insight. 
Verse 23, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Daniel, you are greatly loved. And when you read this, don't get discouraged. Don't say, oh, man. Daniel, his prayer was answered because he is greatly loved. I have good news for you. Guess what? You are greatly loved. You know what Colossians says? It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and what? Dearly loved. In the midst of discipline, God loves you. In the midst of discipline, he wants you to go back to his word. In the midst of discipline, he wants you to pray to him. Why? Because he loves you. He wants to restore you. He wants to point you in the right direction. Then the revelation to Daniel about the Lord. These are just four verses, but I could preach several messages on this. But I'm going to give it to you in about 10 minutes, okay? So four verses, and it's so packed. Why? Because it talks about the rest of Israel's history on earth. It says in verse 24, Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy hill to finish the transgression. Seventy weeks. The word weeks is simply a unit of seven. And whether it refers to days or years depends on context. In this passage, it refers to years. And so Gabriel tells Daniel, you have 490 years in your history. The history of Israel is going to be 490 years. He says, what's going to happen during those 490 years? Messiah will come and he will do several things. He will do things concerning sin and he will do things concerning righteousness. Six things in this verse. It says, he says, first of all, he will finish the transgression. In other words, he will put an end to Israel's disobedience. To put an end to sin. In other words, he, he, will, be, he will pay for the punishment that Israel deserves. He says, and to atone for iniquity. He would make the final atonement. You know, in the, the day of atonement, how every year God will temporarily overlook the sins of the people. Atonement, it covers their sins temporarily. But Jesus on the cross makes that one and perfect sacrifice. So that's concerning sin. Three things concerning sin. Then three things concerning righteousness. Not only will he take away the negative from his people, he would add positive. Look, look at what it says. It says, to bring an everlasting righteousness. When Jesus comes and he, he rules and reigns, guess what? The characteristic of that kingdom would be a kingdom of righteousness. And that's why he says, unless you surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, to seal both vision and prophet. In other words, the fulfillment of all these things that have been promised and then to anoint a most holy place. So in the new Jerusalem, the temple will be rebuilt. And God will once again not only rule, but he will reign. Or he, would also, he will not only be worshipped, but he will also reign in that place, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in order to understand the next three verses, I have to introduce... Remember last week we talked about the, the principle of the gap? Uh, that whenever you see prophecies in the Bible, sometimes they just see the tips of it. And so this, this four verses, it's very packed. It's very dense. It's like uh, one of those files that you send on the computer. What do you call that when it's uh, compressed? And you have to unpack it. You have to open it up. Well, it's kind of, this, is, this is kind of a compressed file. And so what you see are tips of prophecies, and there are gaps in the middle. Let me give you an example. Jesus coming. Remember Gabriel, again, Gabriel, speaking to Mary. He says, and behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. So that's the birth of Jesus. And he will be great, will call the Son of the Most High. That's the first coming. But if you're just reading this, it looks like this describes his, fir his first coming also. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So when did that happen? It hasn't happened yet. Why is that? Because of the gap principle. The first time Jesus came, he came as a suffering servant. The next time he will come as reigning king. The first time as a lamb. The next time as a lion of Judah. But there's been a gap. Since, ever since Jesus came, guess what? There's been over 2,000 years, and one of these days he will come again. So the principle of that a gap or a pause or something in the, in the middle that happens. And so... 
That's important to know. Let, let's, let's go back to our text. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem, to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for seven, 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. That 490 years is divided into three parts. And these are the parts. That's why I could preach on this for a longer time. But I'm just going to give you an overview. This, the first 77 seven or 49 years has to do with the rebuilding of Jerusalem. When did that start? He says, from the time that it's been decreed. There are many decrees. There are many Persian decrees by, by Darius and by Sarius by uh, Cyrus, but this one is by Artaxerxes during the time of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah said, I need permission to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The first three decrees had to do with the temple. This decree has to do with the rebuilding of the wall, which makes it an official city, which may, means that it is now able to defend itself. The fact that Artaxerxes actually gave permission is, is, a, is a miracle from God. But from that time on, which was what? March 5th, 444 B.C. From that time on, the, the clock will be ticking. And it's so important to understand that from that decree, the clock began ticking for the time when Messiah would come. And so the first sevens had to do with the rebuilding of Jerusalem, that even though it took Nehemiah just 52 days to build it, it, it took several years to fix the infrastructure of the city that had been abandoned for 70 years. Okay, so, and then the final seven, which is the last verse, has to do with, which I believe, the last seven years, and you, you could read about it in Revelation, the tribulation period, the time of the great tribulation period, when the Antichrist will rule. And it's at the end of that that Jesus will come. Okay, so let's go back to the text. Those are just background. It says in verse 26, And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. The word cut off talks about execution of a criminal. What happened with Jesus when he first came? He was crucified. He died the death of a criminal. He says, and he shall have nothing. It says, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city in the sanctuary. After Jesus was crucified, do you know what happened to Israel? In 70 AD, Titus came, a Roman general, and he destroyed the city. Remember Jesus, the night he was betrayed, they were walking on Mount of Olives. And he told the disciples, see that building that Herod built, that magnificent temple? Not one stone is going to be left. On top of one another. And sure enough, 37 years later, the Romans came and destroyed the city. So understand that it's not the Antichrist. It's the people of the prince who is to come. So he's still, gonna, he's still kind of preparing you for the time when the Antichrist will come. He says, and it shall come with a flood. And to the end, there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Why is it important? To know how many years and the date that the decree was given. If you look at scholars who have written on this, Dr. Honer, Dr. Alexander, and, and various people who have, who have written on this, they calculate the time from 40, 445, well, 40, depending on which, which year you, you, you get. But it says what they do is they take the Jewish calendar which is 360 days, and they multiply that by 483, which gives you 173, 880 days. So you say, well, pastor, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. When Zechariah prophesied the coming of Jesus, the, the first coming of Jesus of Messiah, he said, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is amazing. If you think of the coming of a king, will he be riding on a donkey or on a white horse? 
stallion. Think of stallion, right? But it was predicted hundreds of years before that the coming of Messiah, that he will be on a donkey. And Jesus, when he was here on earth, told the disciples, go to the next town. Go get that donkey that's there. And as he was going into Jerusalem, people were saying what? Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, previously, Jesus would tell people to be quiet. My hour has not yet come. On that day, he received their worship. And then he says something. He says something in Luke that, that gives me goosebumps when, when, I, when I think about this prophecy. He says, would that you, even you, had known on what? This day, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. According to scholars, if you count from the time of the decree of Artaxerxes all the way to the time of the coming of Jesus in the temple, it was fulfilled. This prophecy was fulfilled to the very day. That's why Jesus says, if you, you religious leaders who know the Bible back and who know scriptures, if you had just studied it more, if you had just looked into it and, and focus on the prophecy concerning Messiah, you would understand that on this day, this prophecy is fulfilled. He says, that, that's why, you know, that, that psalm that we read, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He's talking about this day. He's talking about Jesus who said, if you had just studied your Bible, he says, if you had just studied it, you would know that your Messiah has come. Isn't that amazing? That the, the prophecies of Scripture was fulfilled 480 years later to the very day when Messiah came. Amen. That's why you know that you could trust the Bible. That's why you know that when you read the Bible, what you're reading is true, that you could stake your life on it. You could stake eternity on it. Why? Because the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, just a couple more verses. Let me assure you, we have not exhausted the text. <laughs> we have just exhausted ourselves. But then it says, after 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It shall come with a flood, and at the end there shall be war, desolations are decreed. So that, that's the, the prophecy. But then it says in verse 27, he, talking about the prince that would come, talking about the Antichrist, shall make a strong covenant with many for the one week, and for the half of the week, he shall put on an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. That's talking about the Antichrist. That's talking about the great tribulation period. We don't have time right now. We'll talk more about it in the next, in the next chapter. But simply the gap. Talking again about the gap. The key to understanding, I believe, the key to understanding this prophecy is to note that it's not talking about the church. It is talking about Israel. After the 69th week, when Messiah is cut off, Gabriel did not reveal to Daniel that there will be a gap called the church age, which is us. The Bible says in the New Testament that the church is a mystery. Not that it's mysterious, but it was not revealed in the Old Testament. And so I believe that the next event in the prophetic calendar is the church being raptured or being taken out of the earth. So that once again, God will put his focus on the last week, the last seven years of Israel. So when we talk about the tribulation period in Revelation, it is speaking of that last seven, that last week, that last seven years. We'll talk more about that in the days to come. So what have we seen? We've seen the request of Daniel, God, when will these things happen? God, what, what's in store for Israel? We see the response to Daniel. Gabriel came and says, Daniel, God answered you because you are greatly loved, and we are greatly loved, dearly loved by God. And we see the revelation to Daniel. He, he begins to map out 
the rest of Israel's history all the way to the time of the tribulation period. And at the end, Jesus Christ will come back. During times of trials, I will continue to read the Bible and pray, knowing I am greatly loved and my time is in God's hands. Our time is in God's hands. Let me end with this story. Um, Last week in San Francisco, a couple was killed by a Tesla that was being driven by a woman from Baleo, actually from our town. That's why uh, I remembered or it, it struck me. And this couple was celebrating their third anniversary. They were from Clovis, which is near Fresno. And as they were, they were celebrating it, their third anniversary, what, what's so sad is that this was the uh, guy's second, second marriage, his first marriage. He had two children. And the mom of those two children passed away last year. And so when the car swerved, ran a red light, killed him instantly, killed the husband instantly. And the wife was in critical condition. She's recovering now in San Francisco. But what got me in this story, aside from all that, is that if you go on their Facebook page, because they were celebrating, they were taking selfies, they were taking pictures. And the last entry on Facebook was 1.33 p.m. They got run over at 2 p.m. Less than 30 minutes. They didn't know. They were taking all these pictures. They were so happy. They didn't realize that they had less than 30 minutes to live, that the husband had less than 30 minutes to live. The Bible tells us that we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day because night is coming when no one can work. One of these days, that day will be our last. Whether God takes us home or whether Jesus comes again, One of these days, night is coming when we can no longer work. My friends, I wonder when that time comes, where will you be? Will you be in God's kingdom? Or will you be in darkness forever and ever? Why not trust in the one who came and paid atonement for your sins, who died so that you can be forgiven? If you've never done that, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you to do that right now. Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come to him at this moment. And if that's the desire of your heart, would you just pray this simple prayer just quietly where you're at? Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I hear and now open the door of my heart. I receive you into my life as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, I thank you for anyone who prayed to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their relationship with you. Maybe you are a believer. Maybe you prayed that prayer sometime in the past. And and maybe God is just calling you to to a deeper walk with him. To a greater knowledge of his word. to, To study it. And to spend more time in prayer. Maybe God is calling you to serve. Our times are in God's hands. And those times are precious. That God gives us a limited amount of time to serve him. God gives us a limited amount of time to share the gospel. God gives us a limited amount of time to work until that day comes when we can work no more. So maybe God is just calling you to, uh, to serve him in areas that he has been calling you to that you've been neglecting. Maybe it's just as simple as inviting kids tomorrow to go to VBS or volunteering for VBS. I don't know. But whatever it is God has spoken to you about, would you just commit that to him? Would you just say, Lord, forgive us for we have sinned. And maybe it's, it's to pray for this nation and just to say, Lord, we have acted wickedly. And Lord, revive our nation. Father, I thank you for the prayers of your people. 
you know each heart, Lord, and I pray that you would minister to each one and each family as we end this service. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'm going to call the missions team for uh, who are going to.